So today we're going to be talking about students with exceptionalities and how assessment with them. And I want to preface this um, lecture with them just stating that I'm not an expert on students with exceptionalities, and certainly some of you probably know a lot more than I do. Um, all the information that I'm going to be talking about with students with specific um, exceptionalities is going to be coming from the um, Florida Department of Education's website and the Council for Exceptional Children, the CEC, um, which is a national organization, their website. So let's get started with students with exceptionalities. The first question I'm really going to ask you guys is, why do we need to assess students or make accommodations with students with exceptionalities? And hopefully all of you are saying because it's the right thing to do, right? And we know it's the right thing to do. Um, it, there are also quite a few legal mandates that also um, talk to us about why we're doing this. Um, the first one and the biggest one is IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, which was passed in 1991. It talks about the least restrictive environment, which we also call inclusion, which means that students should be placed in um, a typical classroom for as much of the day as possible that allows them the most educational opportunities that are appropriate for their level of abilities. Um, it also includes that classroom teachers are now part of that IEP process, and an IEP is an individualized education plan, and an IEP is um, what dictates the types of accommodations that are made to curriculum in um, under IDEA. So lots of acronyms here. Um, IEP is the legal document that dictates an individual plan for an individual student. Um, this um, we started first started. Um, Educating all students in 1975 with the edu the past the passage of the Education for All Handi Handicapped Children Act. Prior to 1975, um, student um, schools were allowed to um, deem certain children uneducatable, meaning that they could say you're just not qualified for school and deny educational public education to students um, based upon their levels of ability. And then in 1986, this act was extended to children ages three through five. So starting at age three, students can receive services through the school district um, if they have a disability or a developmental delay. Section 504 is a little bit different than IDEA. Um, this is focused um, on, on um, accessibility of schools. So for example, if you are in a wheelchair, you would be focused on 504, me meaning that you know you would need wheelchair ramps and maybe extra time to get to your classrooms, rather than IDEA, which would be more focused on the curriculum itself. Um, there's lots of other nuances and differences between a 504 and an IEP. Um, oftentimes, students will have both. A 504 is usually a little bit easier and takes less time to do, so oftentimes parents will start off with a 504 and then move into an IEP. Um, in addition, a 504 um, continues with a student past a K-12 through education where an IEP um, only governs through grade 12. So um, if we're thinking about a student who's making that transition from high school to college, we would want to make sure that there was a 504 in place to help with that transition. Um, so the major difference between the two is IEPs tend to be focused on curriculum and testing, whereas 504s tend to be um, focused on um, accessibility, but that can also include accessibility to curriculum. And so um, there, it, it does affect the way in which a teacher um, presents information or um, provides accessibility to things like assessments. So it's really confusing, and you should definitely do more research if this is an area of interest for you. Um, let's talk a little bit about IEPs, Individual Education Plans and Assessment. So IEPs must describe how progress will be measured. So if we're going to have an IEP for a student, oh, sorry, I'm adjusting a little bit here. Um, if we're going to have an IEP for a student, we want to make sure that we're describing how that progress will be measured. So we're giving specific goals. Um, describe when the reports will be issued. Typically, those reports get issued at the same time as either nine-week reports or annually. They should align with the accountability and no child left behind. So typically these align with specific academic achievements um, and state standards. And then they include accommodations for testing. So the only way that I can get an accommodation in a testing, um, like for the FSAs and for the um, state accountability test, is that if it's written into a 504 IEP plan. So if I need extra time on a test, it has to be in that um, IEP, and then it has to be something that's done on a regular basis for students. It can't just be written in the 504 plan or the IEP as something that happens only for the FSAs. It also has to be for classroom assessments as well. And a justification for alternative assessments. So if the student is not going to be taking the FSAs because they're, they're um, not doing academic standards, then we need to provide a justification for why. 
Um, we can also use RTI, which is response to intervention, to address specific learning disabilities. Okay, so let's talk about identification for students with disabilities. Um, if we're going to identify students with disabilities, we want to make sure that those instruments we're using are validated, that they are measuring the constructs we want to measure. So typically, we've identified those ahead of time, thinking about this specific disability we're interested in. So if we're trying to see if a student has a low IQ, we would use an IQ test. If we want to see if a student has a reading disability, we should be using a reading test, etc. Um, that we're using the native language or mode of communication for that student. So obviously, if we have a student whose English, English is not their first language, we should be trying to find an assessment in their native language, or we should be taking into account that Engli an English test would not be a valid assessment of what they know. I say no mode of communication because if we have a student who is deaf, then we need to be assessing them using ASL. It should be tailored to assess the specific area of educational need. Um, it should adequately assess the construct without discriminating against the disability. And we shouldn't be using one single procedure, but a variety of procedures to make a decision. And we should be using a multidisciplinary team, so that might include the classroom teachers, um, special education teachers, administrators at the school, school counselors, school psychologists, including a team of other types of specialists, including speech speech pathologists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, anybody else who might be providing specific supports for students in schools. So let's talk a little bit about the types of special needs. This is a list coming from the Florida Department of Education. These are the specific areas in which we might identify students with special needs, and I'll talk about each one of these briefly. So autism spectrum disorder, um, which includes Asperger's, high-functioning autism, Autism is classified as a developmental disorder um, with significant impairment of communication. So we have everything that ranges a spectrum, right? Everything from nonverbal communication uh, or not lack of communication to verbal. Um, and so when you think about someone with maybe Asperger's syndrome, they might talk a lot. They might have a lot of words, but there's an impairment in that social side of communication in which they might have difficulty understanding social cues or understanding that people might not be as interested in the topic that they're talking about as they are interested. And it's often classified with stereotypical movements. For students with severe autism or on the nonverbal side, they might have um, what we call stimming, and these would be repetitive movements that um, create a sense of comfort. So things like hand flapping or head jerking um, or spinning, those are things that might be soothing to the student or the child um, in really stereotypical ways. It can also be repetitive speech patterns. Um, in higher functioning students, sometimes we see stereotypical or um, focusing on one specific um, area or topic in which they have a hyper focus on and are very interested in. Um, we oftentimes see students with autism spectrum disorder with a sensitivity to sensory input. So that might be the type of clothing that they wear. They might like soft fabrics or they might dislike having tags. Um, they might also be sensitive to loud or sudden noises or to light. Um, they also seem to have a resistance to change. They might very much appreciate to keeping to routines and changes to their environment might be very disruptive to their routines. So they like to have that predictability in general. And again, there's a wide variety of things that are associated with autism. And we tend to think that autism might be a disorder of the frontal lobe or of executive functioning, although there's still a lot for us to learn about what autism is. Um, we classify deaf deaf, hard of hearing, or visual impairments, blind, or partially sighted students, all in one group for the state of Florida, although we know that these are um, encompass a wide variety of things. And for visual difficulties, obviously lots of students um, can see with the aid of devices such as glasses or contacts. Those don't typically get classified here for an IEP. When we're talking about students who would qualify here for the state of Florida, we're talking about students who, who need additional help after the aid of devices. So um, students who might need um, computers to enlarge their text or have significant or who are legally blind or completely blind um, and then we might need additional support um, and then hearing um, and when we're talking about someone who's deaf or who um, who has hearing difficulties um, we might be talking about someone with a hearing aid or with a cochlear implant or someone who doesn't hear at all and would need um, a translator with ASL or who uses ASL exclusively for their um, to, as a form, form of communication. 
for students who are for children who are deaf, they often have a delay in language development because as a baby, if they did not have language early on, that can pose a delay in the in how they learned language. So even in kindergarten or in early early elementary school, that delay in language can still be evident. So we might see delays in that reading and um, writing skills. So we might need to accommodate in our language instruction. Um, we could also, this also includes dual sensory impairments. That would be a student who is, who is, who is both deaf and blind. A more who has difficulty in, in both areas. Developmentally delayed is a category that includes student or who includes children through the age of nine, ages three through nine, who are experiencing developmental delays. And then we use this category to um, to classify students to provide them extra services. Oftentimes, students who qualify as developmentally delayed early in their in their childhood um, will qualify under a different category later on. But this early category of developmentally delayed allows us time for a diagnosis and to get them the assistance that they need. Um, other times we diagnose them as early, developmentally delayed early, we provide that support, that education support for them, and then they can graduate out of the program. And this is what we can consider a huge success story in our, in our um, educational system. Um, emotional and behavioral disabilities. Um, this is some of the categories that are really difficult for teachers to deal with and something that we see on the rise. Um, this includes emotional disabilities um, or emotional impairments, which might include things like depression, anxiety. Um, and then it also includes behavioral disorders and things like oppositional defiant disorder. Um, and we classify these emotional and dis behavioral disabilities as things that interfere with academic learning. Um, Poor academic performance is not due to other disabilities. So a student who's anxious, who's having trouble going to school, um, is going to have poor academic performance, but that's not due to a cognitive issue. Um, it can be classified as um, poor interpersonal relationships, um, inappropriate behaviors or feelings in normal circumstances, that unhappiness, melancholy, or depression, or unfounded physical symptoms or fears associated with school. Um, it's important to note that this depression and unhappiness anxiety can begin as early as kindergarten. We oftentimes think of these types of issues as occurring in adolescence, but it can occur early. And sometimes depression in early childhood or in early grades um, looks a lot like anger um, and acting out rather than the times of depression at characteristics that we see in early childhood. Um, and the types of ways in which we might be assessing these students might just need to be more flexible in our types of assessment arrangements for students. Um, and I want to just go over these warning signs of suicide. Um, you can read these. Um, and I, I just want to be serious here and really tell you guys that anytime a student talks about suicide um, to you or discloses um, anything about suicide to you as a teacher, as an intern, as an adult, it's important that you let the um, person at your school, most likely a school counselor or an administrator, know that this happened. It's not up to you to decide whether or not this is a real threat or that it's a real concern, but it's um, that you as a teacher are sharing a concern and then you can let the professionals decide what needs to happen as a result of that. Um, if the child is in need of additional support. Um, the worst thing in the world would be for a student to, to say something to you and for you not to take action. I think of this a lot like we think of the same thing with child abuse, where you don't have to decide if the abuse is happening, you just report it. Same with thing with this. If there's anything about what a student says or does or they display any of these um, signs, it's important that you let a school counselor or you let the emergency support staff at your school um, know about your concerns so they can provide the help that you need for that your student needs. Um, this is really serious and I know that there's lots of you in this class who've been um, touched in some way by suicide. I just want to know that we as a community, as a school, as an educational system need to work together to help students. And we don't always know when we don't always see these signs for students and sometimes um, you as the adult might be the only adult who the student feels safe with disclosing these types of things to. And um, it's important that we, that we take this into account. So, um, again, um, 
The next category is hospital homebound. These would be students who have some sort of illness um, or disease that, or psychiatric condition that um, are causing them to need to be educated outside of the school setting, whether that's at home or in the hospital. And um, we, this would be where they're getting their, their instruction um, from someone else. So you as the teacher might be providing these assessments or instruction um, to be given to someone else to give to them, or they might be completely out of your um, instruction entirely. Um, intellectual disabilities, um, these would be characterized by low standardized scores on, ability, on um, standardized ability tests, so kind of the opposite of the gifted, gifted side of the students. This might include students with Down syndrome, field alcohol syndrome, etc. Um, this is consistent deficits in adaptive behaviors, and it can range from mild, moderate to severe. A student with mild intellectual disabilities might be a student that is um, part of your classroom, um, experiences maybe with access points or maybe with an aid um, to someone who is severe um, might be um, in a self-contained classroom where they're working on daily living skills. Um, language and speech impairments is another one. Um, then this has um, these words here should sound really familiar. Phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics should sound really familiar for those of you who've taken any reading classes or reading in the content areas. Um, and this would be any kind of impairment with um, the production of speech, so speech impairments, or the um, or the understanding or production of language. So um, processing disorders um, or reading disorders might fall under this. Um, these language impairments. Um, this is a lot where a speech pathologist would be this, the type of person who would work with someone. A lot of times, this is a dual diagnosis here. Speech and language impairments might also go along with students with autism or with intellectual disabilities. Okay. Um, orthopedic impairments um, it can be due to a wide variety of things. Um, some of these, um, such as cerebral palsy and epilepsy, might also be accompanied with cognitive delays. Um, and sometimes those disabilities are not accompanied by um, cognitive delays. And some things like severe breaks and burns are very um, are um, not chronic. They um, they are acute. They happen for a while, and then the students no longer need support. Sometimes they are chronic and will last a long time. Obviously, an amputation would be something that would be um, would would follow a child through their entire school career. So, and again, the types of assessments would vary widely. Um, other health impairments, this is a huge category. This is like our other category, miscellaneous. And here's a whole list of things that it could include. Um, some things on this list like um, leukemia and, um, and oh, sickle cell anemia, some of these acquired brain injury. These are things that um, could require a student to be absent a lot and miss a lot of school and feel sick while they're here at school. So these are the types of things that you might have to make accommodations based on flexible scheduling and access to curriculum. Um, other things like diabetes um, might just make a student, or an asthma might be a very functional student. You might not really even notice in the classroom that it's well controlled. Um, but you might need to do things like for a student who has diabetes, you might need to check their glucose levels um, before a major test to make sure that they're, they're in the right state to take the test, um, et cetera. So um, the next one, attention deficit disorder falls under other health. Um, and um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about this because it's a really common diagnosis for students in your classroom. There's under the new MDSM, um, there are three categories of ADHD. And um, there's the hyperactive type, which would be um, characterized by um, hyperactivity and um, lack of Im impulsivity, or ah, impulsivity, um, kind of constant movement and um, lack of impulse control. Inattentive type would be that kind of lack of focus and difficulty paying attention to the teacher or to things. Um, and the combined type would include both. And um, I think the teachers are pretty good at identifying the hyperactive and combined types of ADHD. But students with the inattentive type are less likely to be identified by teachers and are more often um, more often attributed to things like, oh, they're so lazy, or why are they disorganized, or why can't they just get their act together, why didn't they do their homework? And um, when we see these types of symptoms in students, it's really important to make sure that we're following up to see if there's anything else going on, because it really is a tragedy that we might miss the types of um, 
things that might be really imbalanced for students. So it's this difficulty in focusing and staying focused. And we think of this as, again, a disorder of the executive functioning in the frontal lobe of the brain that um, has problems with making decisions, prioritizing and organizing. So these are the types of things that can really drive a teacher crazy, like, you know, um, writing things down in a planner or putting their homework into the right spot or, you know, forgetting to like answer questions on a test or um, paying attention to directions or being able to follow more than one direction at a time. Okay, specific learning disabilities. This is a huge category that includes lots of things, um, including, um, so it's, it has nothing to do with intelligence um, or ability. It really has to do with um, specific areas in which a student might have difficulty. It would include things like dyscalculia and dyslexia, so specific areas where a student might have difficulty in math or language arts. Um, it could also include some processing disorders as well. This is a category, the, probably the most common category that we would see in a classroom. Um, and we would want to think about how we could make um, accommodations for that within a test, looking at our constructs. Um, we can um, assess this through um, looking at a difference between a student's intellectual abilities and then what they're producing on a test or their achievement. Traumatic brain injuries, our last, we're really going to think about this as like students with concussions who've had some sort of um, injury, most often through sports or through um, an automobile accident are the two most common reasons for this. Um, and it can cause a wide variety of things, um, including kind of those executive functioning type issues in addition to those critical and abstract thinking ideas. It can be memory. It can also be motor function. Okay. Um, there we go. So let's talk about assessment here. Our big idea here with assessment is how can we assess the learning objective, our construct, what we want to assess without the special need interfering, really talking about validity here. So how can I measure what I want to measure without the special need interfering? So let's take a student with dyslexia, right? If I want to measure math, would it be appropriate to have a student with severe dyslexia read word problems? I hope you all said no, right? Because if they're reading word problems, they're pro that dyslexia is going to interfere with my ability to assess them on math problems, word problems. What would be a better way for me to do that? I could read those aloud to them, right, and have them still solve the problem. Now, what if I had a stu that same math student, or that, I'm sorry, that same student with dyslexia and I wanted to measure their reading comprehension? Would it be appropriate for me to read aloud the reading passage to the student with dyslexia? No, right? Because if I'm reading a lot of reading passage, then I'm no longer measuring their reading comprehension, right? I probably actually do want to know how well that student with dyslexia can read, even though it will be difficult for them, right? So thinking about what's my learning objective, what am I measuring, and then what's their special need? So we have difficulties in all of these areas, and I'm going to talk about each one of them separately. So, um, yeah. So the first thing I want to do when I'm, um, thinking about it, test directions is um, I want to make sure that they comprehend and understand what's being asked of them. So I want to make sure that I'm giving them the directions in a variety of ways. I'm asking slowly and I'm checking back with other students who have, who have exceptionalities to make sure that they understand what's being asked. Um, for short answer and essay questions, I want to make sure that um, I might need to adapt these questions in some ways. I might need to define the terms I'm asking or provide scaffolding for those essay questions or even do something like allow them to do some sort of graphic organizer rather than write out a full test. For multiple choice items, I could um, have them circle the items rather than transfer. If I have a student who might have difficulty with that, I could um, give them fewer choices between them. I could give them fewer questions. And really remembering here with all of our items that if we're going back to how to write good items, um, poorly constructed items are going to disadvantage our students with disabilities more. They're going to be less able to understand an, a poorly worded item. For binary choice items, they can circle the correct answer, um, keeping them clear and as easy to understand as possible. For completion items um, or fill in the blank items, I could give them a word bank or I could provide larger, larger blanks for students with fine motor difficulties. For performance assessments, these are a great way to assess students with exceptionalities because they provide a wider range of responses so students with exceptionalities can um, respond to their performance assessment at their own level, but I still might need to provide additional scaffolding. 
Um, a lot of times with um, students with disabilities, a common accommodation for tests is to give them more time. And I want us to stop and think about this for just a minute, um, because I don't think that extra time is always as helpful as we'd like it to be. Of course, it's going to take a student with disabilities more time to do a test, but giving them more time isn't always as helpful because um, we're also asking them to attend and work longer on that test. And I don't know, when a task is really hard, it's more difficult to spend more time on it, right? So sometimes rather than giving them a longer test, it's helpful to give them a shorter test. So they're still going to work an hour, but instead of trying to get 50 questions done, they're only going to try to do 25. If they need to do all 50, I might give them in chunks of time. Think about a student with ADHD saying, okay, you can spend two hours on this test. Probably isn't going to help them that much. Instead, I might give them the test in 15-minute blocks, allowing them to take breaks. Um, anxiety. Lots of times students with disabilities have anxiety around testing, and that's because they, um, when they haven't been successful at something like assessments, then they often get anxiety around that that kind of thing that's happening. So um, we might want to try to alleviate or lessen that anxiety around testing for them. So making tests positive, calling them, you know, celebrations of learning, right? Um, giving, really talking about the growth that they've made and their own internal characteristics rather than comparing them to others and giving them and really letting them know what's going to be happening on that test so that they have a lot of practice ahead of time. Um, we want to try to lessen the embarrassment that they might have around getting a different test or a test under different circumstances. So just trying to keep it as normal as possible, being as discreet as possible with any kinds of changes we might need to do for these students. Um, and then this is the biggest difference for students with disabilities or students with exceptionalities is the variability of behavior. Every student with disabilities um, has more variation in their test achievement than other types of students. So students with disabilities are going to show more variability than other students. So we want to allow retesting. We want to make sure that students can reschedule and maybe even give them some a chance to reschedule for a time that they think might be better for them. We also might want to take some notes. So like if a student tends to do better at the beginning of the day or after lunch, we might want to know that. Or if they do better on a Monday or a Wednesday, um, depending on the circumstances of each child. We might want to just kind of know those types of things. And if we see a student with, a, with a exceptionality that does poorly on an assessment, we would want to give them a chance to retake or to redo that assessment, knowing that there's going to be more variability in how they, in how they are assessed or how they perform on assessments. So for our in-class activity, um, I'd like you to just take a little bit of time to um, to see if you can think about some accommodations for each of these groups of students. If you have difficulty doing this, please let me know and um, I can help you. I can talk you through some of these. Other than that, have a great day and I look forward to your work this week. Bye!